Welcome again. So, welcome, welcome everybody. Sebastian. We will be listening to a talk of my, my <clears throat> Miko Miller. We will talk about the MediaWiki stack. At the end of the talk, there will be a Q&A session. Please refrain from leaving so there's no chaos and just wait until the questions are done and then just go to the next talk. Have fun. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me OK in the back? Awesome. So I'm going to start with a question. If you imagine most of the big websites, Facebook, Yahoo, etc., there's a bunch of important differences to Wikipedia. What happens if you're on a site at that scale using only free software, no proprietary bits, with a commitment to transparency and user privacy, very different values, and a commitment also to being collaborative in partnership with the community in everything we do as a nonprofit organization. My name is Eric Miller. I run the technology de department at the uh, Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I've been involved in Wikipedia since 2001, started as a volunteer. Um, there's a bunch of us here. Can I ask the folks who are affiliated with Wikimedia as volunteers, staff members, or in some other form to please stand up? All the Wikimedians, please stand up. All right. So, and there's a small Wikipedia table outside as well. So, if you would like to speak to a friendly Wikimedian, there's plenty of opportunities to do so here. And I can't answer all your questions, so please ask our friends. So, the way I think about the technology stack in our world is in these different layers. So I'm not going to talk about the content here at all. I'm just going to talk about the tech. And each of these layers in our world is open, fully open source, uh, fully reusable for your purposes, even if they have nothing to do with ours. So we start at the infrastructure layer, and that's the servers. Unfortunately, like there is some proprietary bits on the hardware side of things. But as far as um, the bulk of the software is concerned, like, really, that's open source as well, including all the config and so forth. Um, the actual MediaWiki core application, as well as all the services associated with MediaWiki, um, the uh, programming capabilities that MediaWiki provides to end users, which are quite unusual relative to other web applications, and the third-party applications and bots that interact with the Wikimedia content in some way. So starting with the infrastructure bits, if you go to ganglia.wikimedia.org, you can actually get our monitoring information from our cluster and really poke around and see how everything is set up. We have about a thousand-ish servers. We've got a primary data center in Ashburn, Virginia, um, which serves most of our um, actual application server load. And then we've got caching centers um, in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands. Um, we've got one that we're setting up in San Francisco as well. Um, and we've got a, an old secondary da data center in Tampa uh, that we're decommissioning right now. So that's where, where our servers are. And as you can see in this drop-down list, um, they serve different functions, different types of caching layers, uh, storage layers, etc. cetera. Um, unfortunately, MediaWiki itself isn't quite as service-oriented as we'd ideally like it to be. Um, like, we often have to spin up a full MediaWiki application, even for just serving a very narrow purpose. Um, but some of these services are very well isolated. And all of this stuff is in version control. So version control for us means Git, but it doesn't mean GitHub. We don't use GitHub because GitHub itself is not free software. Uh, it's an increasing problem for the free software movement that people become dependent on proprietary solutions to write free software. We try to avoid that. Um, so we use something called Garrett, which is an open code review tool that also function as, functions as our Git repository for all the code. Um, and by the way, I didn't mention this in the title slide, but also for those of you who came in late, if you want to follow along, bit.do slash devlinks has all the links um, to get started. And I'm going to show the URL again at the end. So within our Git repo, you find various repositories just for, for example, the operations side of things. Like, of course, you find MediaWiki and everything associated with that. 
but you also find our Apache config, you find our DNS config, you find our Debian packages, um, you find our entire Puppet configuration. So if you're in, interested in the infrastructure side of things, you can get involved in that as well. You can submit change sets to that as well. You can reuse Puppet Manifest for your own purposes or learn from them. Like it's all out there. The only thing you won't find in there obviously are private server passwords. So as a, a simple example, what you see here are the top contributors to the MediaWiki config repository. So this is literally the configuration of the MediaWiki application itself as it is running on our cluster. And what's interesting about this is that even that configuration is entirely public and it's something that you can contribute to as a volunteer, not just as a staff member of the foundation. Which is very, very different like from pretty much any other site out there. Like imagine trying to change the configuration of Facebook or Gmail. Like you can actually submit changes to Wikipedia's config and if you look at the list of names here, the folks who are highlighted in yellow are volunteers in our community and that's the number of change sets that they have submitted and gotten merged into our configuration. And it gets even more interesting if you look at the folks in orange, those are folks who are now staff members of the foundation but who previously were involved in some form in the volunteer community. So really the Wikimedia Foundation has a very strong overlap with the volunteer community. People tend to get involved as volunteers, maybe while they're still at university or doing it part-time along some, some other job that at some point they might decide they don't like to do anymore. And at some point they might get involved in the foundation as staff members. And we think that's a very positive thing where uh, as a movement and ecosystem we can financially make it possible for the most prolific and effective volunteers to ultimately turn this into a profession as well. But to me the amazing thing about this is that you can submit configuration changes for almost anything imaginable. So I have a, a story of a volunteer who in their spare time just fixed a bunch of logos and a bunch of private wikis that he didn't even have access to. Like, he looked at a wiki that he saw an operations engineer create and said, hmm, this logo looks a little bit off, submits a config change and gets it merged. And it doesn't even benefit him in any, in any way because it's not a public wiki and he still does it. So that's the kind of thing that you can do within an open ecosystem. Now let's talk a little bit about MediaWiki itself. Can I ask who has used MediaWiki, whether it's in Wikipedia or in, in some other context before? So I don't think I have to talk much about the basics here. You're all more or less familiar with the MediaWiki engine. It's been around for a long time. Actually, the first software that Wikipedia used was just a Perl script uh, called UseModWiki. Then it was rewritten in PHP. It was rewritten a bunch of more times. And you're probably familiar with the way it typically looks when you edit a Wikipedia article, you've got a crap load of markup, um, but there's a bunch of complex functionality underneath this. Can I ask who here understands what a template is in the context of MediaWiki? Okay, that's, I would say, about 50%, 60% of the room. So, a template um, is the stuff that you see here in this uh, markup that's the double curly braces. And that's basically loading a page from within the wiki, substituting a bunch of parameters into that page with a bunch of values, and returning that page um, in a reusable form in this, as, as a transclusion in this existing page. So the basic purpose of it is that you have these reusable content blocks um, that you can use, for example, to have info boxes and articles always look the same way. And that's one of the more complex features of MediaWiki. And so you see a lot of this functionality hidden within the markup. Another characteristic of MediaWiki, of course, is that it's very well internationalized because Wikipedia is available in 250 languages, so the software has been uh, localized at the wazoo. Uh, excuse my language. And you uh, may not have seen this, however, which is our new editor uh, that we've been working on in the last couple of years, and that provides a rich text interface to the content now, 
there's a lot of rich text editors out there, but of course this one also has to deal with these things like templates. So if you click on a template in the editor, it allows you to edit the parameters and values through the UI and see the result immediately. And when you save the edit, it serializes it as wiki text. So it actually does a transformation between the annotated HTML5 uh, back into wiki text and tries to serialize it without a dirty diff being introduced in the process. So if I add a link like I did in this example, it adds just that part of the content that I modified as wiki text back into the page, which is actually pretty challenging. You may also have seen this, and this is an example of a talk page, if you can read it. Um, but basically what you're seeing here is um, the contents of a discussion in Wikipedia and what you have to do in order to comment in a Wikipedia talk page is you edit it like any other page and you insert your comment at the right place, indent it with a bunch of colons, sign it with a signature marker and then save, which is pretty hackish um, because MediaWiki doesn't have the notion of a comment, it only has the notion of a page. And something that we've been working on recently is a system called Flow, um, which you can also check out. Um, and that's basically a proper uh, discussion system for MediaWiki um, where you have the notion of a comment and you've got a just inline response um, capabilities and everything that you'd expect, but it still also has the features of the wiki like uh, all the capabilities of the markup and so forth. But MediaWiki can also look completely different from that. Uh, and this is uh, Wikidata, which is a project which uh, we launched a couple years ago, uh, developed by Wikimedia Germany, and it's also a MediaWiki extension uh, called Wikibase, plus a bunch of other extensions um, which you can install for MediaWiki. And Wikidata's purpose in our ecosystem is to provide a central repository of structured data for all our wikis. So if you think about a, an article like the article about Germany, you've got the population, you've got the GDP, and you've got a bunch of other data points. And those data points uh, in the pre-wiki data world are copied from one language to the next, to the next, to the next. So the German, French, R Russian, Italian, Wikipedia all have their own copies of that data, which needs to be independently maintained, often with help of bots that automatically make changes um, based on what sources are saying. Um, but obviously that introduces a lot of room for inconsistency and the purpose of Wikidata is to have a central repository where you can have a language independent item about the country of Germany and then an annotate it with keys and values like population, like GDP, load that data into whatever context you want to load it into. The properties and values can be defined by the community and new properties are introduced through a process of negotiation and consensus all the time. So this really is a multilingual ontology that's maintained by a community, which is pretty powerful. And the software itself is just another MediaWiki extension. In uh, this case, what is being done here in, in the background is that uh, MediaWiki has this notion of a content handler. And a content handler is basically a, uh, a set of code that gets executed to um, handle content of a different type. Uh, so within MediaWiki, you can say, within the article namespace, instead of treating it like a text page, uh, we want to treat it, in this case, like a data item and run the software that's required to do that for that namespace. Um, so that creates the capability to really create essentially arbitrary uh, data and content types within MediaWiki and make them collaboratively editable. But even as an end user, off MediaWiki, even as a Wikipedian, you have programming capabilities that go well beyond um, what's typically found in most um, websites. So this is an interesting example. You probably can't read it because it's, it's pretty small, um, but it's a Lua script. So the way Lua is used within our, um, within, within our world is it's a scripting language for templates. So I mentioned earlier that templates are these reusable content blocks. So Think of a typical Wikipedia article. A typical Wikipedia article has 200, 250 like, citations if it's a very long article. Each of these citations, if you click on the footnote, is formatted according to some standard stylistic guidelines. In order to ensure that those standard stylistic guidelines are actually maintained, templates are used to format the citations. So I pass, say, the author name and the title and the publication year and a bunch of other metadata to a template 
and it spits out the citation in the standard format that is preferred for this type of citation. That's actually computationally expensive if you do it 300 times in the same page, and particularly if you do that kind of programming in Wikitext itself, which is what we did two, three years ago. So the rendering of all these templates that are used to format, for example, citations, added a pretty substantial uh, computational overhead to rendering of basic Wikipedia articles, which means that if you preview or save, you wait 5, 10, 15 seconds for all these templates to be rendered. So in order to reduce that computational overhead, we added support for modules being implemented within the wiki itself using Lua, an embeddable scripting language. And we chose Lua in part because it's good for string manipulation, in part because it's very easy to control memory usage and stack usage and make sure that execution time and memory usage doesn't exceed certain limits because you're executing like hundreds of these calls within a single page. In the back end, there's a, an actual, uh, there's two versions to run this. If you want to run it in your MediaWiki installation, you can just shell out to the Lua binary. That's not very efficient, but there's also a PHP extension called Lua Sandbox that you can install, and that basically uses shared memory to uh, run these little Lua modules, so it's more efficient. And in this case, just to give you an idea of just the complexity that's hidden in Wikipedia, um, this particular section of the citation Lua module, which has 2,000 lines of code, handles just the question, what happens if you cite a, uh, a particular article within the pub, um, public, um, PubMed Central, which is this gigantic uh, archive of medical uh, citation metadata. If you cite an article from that catalog, and that article has an embargo on it, that it's not publicly available until a certain date, do not render an external link because it's still under embargo. After that date, you can render the link. Like at that level of branching, you have complexity in like the citation formatting in Wikipedia. So that's done now using Lua. And the benefit of that is frankly that it's a lot faster. Um, so it's still, uh, certainly there's still um, room for optimization both in the parser and, uh, and, and in other parts of MediaWiki, but um, this makes it a lot more viable to have a community um, just randomly create these types of modules. And what you also saw earlier is that we actually have a code editor in MediaWiki. So I think this is the ACE editor, if I remember correctly. And it basically, when you edit Lua modules or JavaScript in MediaWiki, um, then it just invokes the code editor instead of the normal editor. And it has the normal features that you would expect for like properly editing source code and syntax highlighting and, and so forth. So people actually edit and version code directly in the wiki. They don't use an external version control dependency uh, for maintaining these modules. They just do it on wiki, which is pretty neat. We have thought about potentially making these modules more shareable. Right now, they are locally stored within, say, the English Wikipedia. So if the German or French Wikipedia want to have their own uh, citation modules, then they have to uh, essentially copy the code over, which is obviously not ideal. So both for this and other types of on-wiki code contributions, we have thought about maybe plugging it into Git or plugging it into a central code repo that's maintained on wiki. Another similar capability is, um, has been around in MediaWiki for a pretty long time and um, has been significantly extended since it was first introduced. And that's basically support for JavaScript being written on Wiki and executed on a each page view. Um, there's uh, different ways to do that. It sounds pretty scary, and it actually is pretty scary, but it's also pretty neat. Um, if you're an administrator on a MediaWiki instance, and administrator in our case doesn't mean you yeah, are like a site admin, it means typically that you're a trusted community member, so in English Wikipedia that's about 3,000 users. If you're an admin, then you can edit pages in a protected namespace called MediaWiki, and within that protected namespace you can edit things like user interface messages, um, but you can also edit the JavaScript that's loaded on each page view. So you can potentially introduce new functionality just by editing the JS just going through the wiki to do that. 
But even as an, uh, a user without special privileges, you can create JavaScript that's executed for your page views um, within your user namespace. So this particular user uh, started this script uh, many years ago uh, called popups.js. Uh, so as you can see in the header, uh, they created this page called user colon lupin slash popups.js. And that particular page um, is included from their skin JS. So for their particular default skin that they have set in their preferences, this JavaScript gets run uh, on each page view. So that means that they have the ability to introduce various forms of functionality ranging from like tiny UI changes to very complex new features. Because you can, of course, make API requests within your own browser session being authenticated as yourself. So you can potentially even perform edits or uploads or other write operations as a user. So you can really build uh, functionality beyond just um, being able to um, like change the skin or change uh, the appearance a little bit. And so this particular feature is actually pretty neat. Um, what it does is if you're on Wikipedia and you mouse over an article title, it gives you a little preview um, of the first section of the article rendered uh, as HTML with the first thumbnail of the article in the top right corner, a bunch of embedded actions so you can instantly edit the article or do a bunch of other stuff with it. And you can even go like from one pop-up to the next so you can sort of navigate uh, articles without even leaving the page that you're on. So it's a, a pretty nice feature. Um, we're actually doing a, a design pass on it and are, are considering integrating it into um, the core functionality of the site, um, which is a nice example of like taking something uh, that a volunteer has developed and working with that uh, individual and saying, okay, how can we make this, this thing better and make it potentially part of everyone's user experience. But what's also interesting about it is that what happened with this eventually is it became very popular. So this user only put it in their own user namespace and other users started copying it into theirs and eventually someone said this should be a gadget. A gadget in media key means you're basically taking um, a, a set of JavaScript and dependencies like CSS uh, resources and you're calling it by a name and you're giving it a description and you're making it available in the user preferences for every user. In order to do that, you have to edit this special page. Again, it's in the MediaWiki namespace, as you can see in the top MediaWiki colon, which means it's restricted to administrators. Um, so you edit this page and you add a line which basically says what's the message name that describes what this thing does, what's the JavaScript file that it requires, and what other dependencies does it have. You can potentially specify even that it is loaded by default for all users without having to be explicitly enabled. And so in this case, if I go to my user preferences in English Wikipedia or you do, anyone, um, then you'll find this navigation pop-ups under the gadgets section and you can just turn it on with one click. And as you can see, this is a, the beginning of a very long list of those types of features which users have created essentially just by creating a bunch of JavaScript in the wiki. So it's really very easy without even having to install Git or a development environment or anything uh, to write features for Wikipedia that uh, if they become popular can be used really even by default in some of these gadgets have been turned on by default. The one sort of caveat is that it's a little too easy sometimes and we um, uh, have to carefully monitor things like performance regressions if some admin in Russian Wikipedia decides to turn on some gadget by default which adds like three seconds latency on each page view, that's not so great. Um, so we do have to monitor what's going on. We have to monitor it for security issues um, which have been surprisingly uncommon given just how easy it is to uh, write these gadgets. One thing that sort of helps is that you never know which gadgets or user scripts a particular user really has installed. And so it doesn't present as obvious an attack vector as you might think, but still um, it's a bit scary. So I covered a lot of ground around like the, the stuff that you can do on Wiki. But chances are that if you're not a Wikipedian, um, then that might not be the kind of thing you, you might be interested in doing. Chances are, though, that you are someone who's writing an application that in some way wants to interface either with Wikipedia 
or our other projects or other media wikis out there. And so um, for that purpose, of course, you would use our API, um, which is self-documenting and reasonably easy to use. Um, there are many, many examples of really neat things uh, that people have done um, with Wikipedia content, um, whether it's external tools for editing Wikipedia, or whether it's um, uh, hundreds of different kinds of bots. Wikipedia is actually very dependent on bots. Um, a, a lot of small and um, major cleanup operations are performed by bots. There are bots that literally check each edit uh, that's made to Wikipedia and scan it for evidence of plagiarism. And if they find evidence of plagiarism, they might put a notice on that page and say this article is under review uh, as, as being un suspected of being a copy of something else on the web that existed before this article was created. Um, so there's a lot of these helpers that people have written over the years. If you want to play with the API, um, check out the links, bit.do slash devlinks, and you'll find a link to uh, the API sandbox, which is one nice way that you can sort of experiment with constructing uh, an API query. There's a sample API query that's in the links that gives you metadata for an image on Wikimedia Commons. Um, so uh, you can get structured data about content, but you can, of course, also perform write operations if you request the appropriate token beforehand. And this sandbox lets you just play with the query parameters, see the results, look at the different output formats. Um, so it's a nice way to learn uh, how the API works. One very interesting thing about Wikimedia is that because there's such a great interest by volunteers in creating these kinds of tools and bots, um, very early on uh, we found it necessary to provide them with um, mechanisms to host these tools and to run them. And so uh, even five, six years ago, we created an uh, environment with Kimia Germany, in this case did, called Tool Server, um, which we have now uh, are taking on as the foundation of the name Tool Labs, which lets you host tools, web services, bots, and anything else you might want to do uh, with regard to Wikimedia content, um, whether it's a bot that accesses the API and performs edit operations, whether it's a tool that does something in Wikipedia, you can get free hosting for it. Uh, you also get access to what's called LabsDB, which is a sanitized version of our production databases, so you can perform queries against the real world uh, Wikipedia databases as well as other project databases and run uh, SQL queries. Um, so your tool can actually do pretty powerful things, potentially. And so if you look at tools.wmflabs.org, you'll find an index of all the tools that have been built, of which there are now a few hundred uh, that do uh, uh, very, very different kinds of things. And one thing that makes it um, more interesting now to write tools is that we recently added support for OAuth. So OAuth, as you know, uh, lets you uh, granularly uh, authorize rights for an application to perform actions on your behalf. So you've probably seen it in many other uh, websites where you say, I'm going to give this app access to my Twitter account or whatever, and you can do the same now um, with uh, MediaWiki sites. So you can give an application or service access to perform edit operations, upload operations, whatever, on your behalf. So we launched this a few months ago, and a few days later, a volunteer created this tool called Crop Tool. Um, which is basically just a simple web-based tool running in tool labs that lets you crop images. So this is what it looks like. So you have an image and you want to get rid of the border, um, perform, a, um, perform a crop and ideally do it in a lossless manner so you don't introduce new uh, JPEG artifacts after the, the crop is done. And this tool lets you do exactly that. And it uses OAuth to perform um, the write operation in Wikimedia Commons. So that's the kind of thing that wasn't possible until recently, and people came up with all kinds of hacks to try to do it, and now it's trivially easy to write these kinds of applications. So if you wanted to write a tool that edits articles or edits SVG images using an open source SVG editor, like you can do all these kinds of things now, and you don't even have to host it in our environment. The way this works is that uh, there's a consumer registration form uh, on MediaWiki.org uh, that you can fill in to provide the required metadata for your OAuth consumer. Uh, then you get the consumer key that you can use uh, to perform OAuth authenticated requests. 
on a user's behalf. And so you have to provide a bunch of data, wait a couple of days, and then your tool uh, is available for use. And so a simple API query just passes uh, the consumer key and the token that you previously obtained, uh, plus uh, a bunch of OAuth-related metadata um, to um, provide the required information to the API to perform a particular operation, whether it's a write operation or, or whatever else you're trying to do um, on a user's behalf. So it's pretty simple to use, and if you check the links, you'll find a couple of examples that you can easily copy and, and use in your own application. So I'm just at about 30 minutes, and I think I'm going to leave it at that because I think that's about the time when your attention span is going to wander and you're going to think about the delicious fast food outside. Um, so I'm going to uh, turn over to questions and uh, take it uh, to a more open discussion format so we can go into more detail on anything um, that I brought up. Thoughts? Things you'd like to know more about? I just wanted the question why you're using Lua. Why did you pick Lua as a Yeah, I mentioned it briefly. Like the, the most important factor in our decision to, to use Lua was performance. So the, the reason to support Lua in the first place for templates was performance related. Um, we wanted to make it um, a really you know, to get the performance benefit of like 5x plus when you have like these 300 uh, templates in, in a single page that need to be executed. And the nice thing about Lua is that it's designed for the embedded use case, and so it's very easy to control memory usage. It's very easy to control stack usage. And so we, we found it, uh, after analysis of various options, to be the best option for that particular use case. With that said, um, there's been some experimentation around using V8 for um, running uh, JavaScript and templates. Personally, I think long term that would be the right answer, but I also don't think you would want to manipulate wiki text um, using JavaScript. I think at that point, you're really talking about an entirely next generation stack where you're manipulating HTML5 in the back end using JavaScript as a server-side scripting language. Um, I don't think JavaScript is the right language even to manipulate wiki text uh, in the way that it's done right now in templates. Hey, hey, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I was wondering, has the, has the server load like with PHP been an issue? And have you been experimenting with the, uh, the VM from Facebook, uh, the experimental PHP VM, which is supposed to be faster? I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, actually, we're just, sorry. We're just starting to um, experiment with HHVM in earnest. And we're very likely to move MediaWiki and our production environment over to being executed within uh, HipHop VM. Um, just to get that performance benefit. There's a bunch of stuff, of course, that we need to make sure works correctly, various PHP extensions that we're using and so forth. Um, but generally speaking, we're very excited about it, and we're working directly with the Facebook folks on doing that. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, just a question about the financial aspect, who, which is uh, important for uh, open and uh, f free and independent uh, project. Uh, how Wikipedia uh, concretely uh, can survive with uh, all uh, uh, necessity of money by just using a private donation? How, how is the... How by just using what? A private donation. My English is very low, low. Sorry. Private donations. It's a free market, baby. Like, donations are just another form of market transactions, and it happens to be the case that people value Wikipedia and give it money because they want to support it, and it's a very scalable model. Um, just because it isn't tied to a um, direct result in form of a good service that you exclusively are being given doesn't mean that it doesn't scale. And that's mean it's, it's it can continue like this uh, forever? Absolutely. All right. Yes. Uh, to continue on the first question, why are you using Lua? I was wondering why are you not using uh, Lua JIT? Uh, the uh, JIT compiler for Lua. Um, do you want to take that one, Patrick? <laughs> So because uh, MediaWiki is written in PHP, it's easy to implement PHP extensions in the stack. 
So embedding Lua in a PHP extension uh, oh, made the most sense, sense at the time. Uh, we could still explore doing other things inside that extension, but right now it makes the most sense the way it's architected. Okay, but I, I suppose it's just drop-in replacements mainly. So. Okay, thanks. What was the question? The last one. Oh, oh yes, uh, my remark was that uh, it's probably you can use it as a drop-in replacement mostly, so I, I suppose it would work. So all the source code for the extension is available on Garrett, so if you wanted to look at replacing what's there now with something else that has the same performance uh, guarantees, you're welcome to volunteer and uh, commit that code. Well played. <laughs> Anybody, any questions or remarks? Always. <laughs> Jobs.wikimedia.org. Just please raise your hand if you have any questions or remarks. Wave it. Ah. Did you have problems with scaling PHP? Well, of course, we had problems with scaling, period, right? Uh, so getting to um, 20 billion page views a month isn't easy no matter what technology you use. And so nowadays, if you're hitting wikipedia.org, 99% um, of the time you're going to hit a varnish cache because you're a logged out user. Um, and so you're just getting static HTML. Um, you're not hitting an application server. You're not invoking PHP at all. And so that's been probably the single biggest um, impact on our uh, scalability of our site. I would say as far as scaling PHP is concerned, we're very excited about HHVM for that reason because the parts of um, MediaWiki right now that are slow and difficult to scale, like the parser, will significantly benefit from a fast execution environment like that. Thank you. Hi. So given you've got this wonderful open stack on top of your, your servers and you say you've got this proprietary layer underneath where you've got your hardware and you're already working with Facebook guys, is there any reason you didn't go for the open compute and open rack models? Just a, a matter of really actually properly assessing it. We've got our sort of existing record of the kinds of infrastructure that we've used for the last uh, 12 years and um, potentially trying completely open hardware approach within our data centers is just a matter of putting in the effort to make it work. You're welcome to help. And donate hardware. And donate hardware. <laughs> when will you be accepting bitcoins for donations? Oh, my favorite question. <laughs> when will we take bitcoins for donations? So, Honestly, like I don't have a, uh, the organization doesn't have any kind of beef with Bitcoin as such. It's more a question of, is it worth our effort to integrate another um, payment method that requires, for example, integration with our CRM if we want to contact donors and follow up with them, which we generally do uh, with all payment systems. And the reality is that um, economically, uh, there's not a lot of evidence that it's particularly advantageous. So for us, it's a pragmatic decision. We're not ideologically in favor or against Bitcoin. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Downstairs. Yeah, one more question with my bad English. So uh, <laughs> that's about um, video uh, format who is uh, right now uh, difficult to, to upload on the site because there is a limit of, I, I think it's 10 me megabytes, something like this. And for me, it's, pity, it's a pity because uh, an online encyclopedia is a place where we can spread this kind of uh, uh, knowledge and media. And what's about the, the future of, about the, the, this subject? So for those who didn't hear the question, it was about video and why there is a, a limit of 100 megabytes for files and what the future of video for 
uh, Wikipedia would be. So you can actually turn on an experimental preference under uploads on Wikimedia Commons, which is called chunked uploading, that lets you upload up to 500 megabytes in one go. And so it just is a more reliable upload method in theory, but it still needs a bit of work, so it's not on by default yet. Um, but the idea is to raise the, the upload limit to 500 megabyte, and you can try that today. Um, as far as video in general is concerned, it's a, a complex thing because as you, if you were in Michael Day's presentation just before mine, he was talking about like the state of open video today and it's still a battlefield. Apple and Microsoft are not really supporting open video. Google and Mozilla are trying to make it work. Um, WebM uh, slash VP8 slash VP9 are finally getting to the point where hardware makers are starting to support it, but the reality is still like in certain markets and with certain browsers, it's very hard to make it work. We are committed to making it work. We're not going to go down the proprietary video road with H.264, but that also makes it harder for end users to upload video right now and to use it if they're not using a system that's already well supported. Um, but we are going to work with Google and with others to try to improve the usability. As far as the actual content is concerned, I entirely agree with you that there's a ton of potential there, as you can see with sites like Khan Academy, um, like there's a lot that you can teach with video um, for certain audiences in certain contexts that you can't teach as easily with text. The other factor, by the way, if you happen to be active in this space, um, whether it's like Khan Academy or OpenCourseWare or whatever, a lot of that stuff is licensed with like a non-commercial restriction, which is evil and needs to be eliminated. So um, please convince people to get rid of the non-commercial restriction on their educational videos. Can we have a warm round of applause for Eric? Thank you all for coming.